Today's episode of OK Podcast is brought to you in part by D'Addario. D'Addario makes some of the world's finest instrument strings and musical accessories right here in the USA. They're committed to sustainability as part of their business practice through the Playback Program, which is a string recycling program that's recycled over 1 million sets of strings to date. For more information about this program and how you can help D'Addario reach their goal of 2.5 million string sets for 2018, see D'Addario.com slash playback. That's D-A-D-D-A-R-I-O dot com slash playback. Need a new set of strings for your guitar? Head to your local music store and grab a set of D'Addario strings today. Or simply go to okpodcast.com slash strings and pick up a set on Amazon right now. Try Amazon Prime for free shipping to your doorstep. Again, that's okpodcast.com slash strings. In typical Radiohead style, OK Podcast is pay what you want. If you'd prefer to get early access to an ad-free version of the podcast, also presented in high-resolution audio, upgrade now at okpodcast.com slash gold. That's okpodcast.com slash gold. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. You're listening to OK Podcast, a podcast by Sean Perrin about Radiohead. Sean Perrin about Radiohead. Hi, I'm Sean Perrin, host of OK Podcast, the show where I dive deep into the musical and cultural impact of the world's greatest band, Radiohead. If you've ever tried to learn a Radiohead song on guitar, you probably learned it on YouTube and probably from Warren Lane's YouTube channel called Warren Music. Warren has over 30,000 subscribers, but is perhaps best known for his viral analysis of videotape that received over 5 million views. Today we get to know a little about Warren's musical upbringing, his new ear training course that he's featuring on his website, how Radiohead completely blew his mind musically, and some tips and tricks for learning Radiohead tunes by ear. Show notes for today's episode can be found at okpodcast.com slash one. I was going to a Montessori school when I was three years old, just during recess, and I heard somebody playing a piano at the school. And my earliest memory was I was just standing there, like with my jaw open, you know, like listening to this guy playing piano. And I don't think it was anything particular. There wasn't, I, I couldn't even tell you, tell you what piece it was, but uh, it was just, just this early raw fascination with music and, and, um, that led me to, to play and um, into taking some piano lessons and then quitting because I didn't like sight reading. Um, it didn't feel natural for me. And then I almost quit. But then I found my way back into music um, through the guitar. And I played a lot uh, for my church and um, eventually just solidified my love for, for music by uh, declaring that I wanted to study ethnomusicology uh, when I went to college. So... Um, UCLA had a had a great ethnomusicology program, so I just uh, decided I'm going to go crazy. I'm going to study music, you know, even though it's the most impractical, uh, surefire way to end up destitute. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go back to that day when you heard the piano. I mean, did it make you feel um, interested emotionally or interested intellectually or both? Oh, there was there was definitely um, no intellectualizing it at that age. I think um, I think it was it was pretty pure emotion. Uh, as I've gotten older and gotten into theory, I think um, I love I love analysis and getting into the more intellectual side of things. But um, I think at the end of the day, if a piece of music doesn't move you uh, deep down, then it, it does it hasn't done its job, you know. I know a lot of musicians, and on my other podcast called Clarinet, I've spoken to some of the, the greatest musicians in, in the world, for example, from the New York Philharmonic. And uh, one thing I noticed about the great musicians, and yourself included, is that they always seem to maintain that passion for the music. And I think a lot of people lose that as they get older. So what is the secret to you to keep that passion going? Oh, man. Uh, there, there's a certain kind of way I would characterize uh, when I when – I, come away from the musical experience inspired. And uh, maybe that's kind of similar to what you're talking about. Um, but there's just, usually it comes down to some kind of electricity. I, I just call it that, you know, um, when I'm at a show, uh, it, it doesn't have to be Radiohead, even though from my YouTube channel, it looks like that that's the only thing I listen to. There's something about the performance. There's something about music live that I mean you sometimes you can capture that lightning in a bottle and in a recording 
but uh, there's something about um, experiencing music in the actual airwaves hitting your ears, you know, um, that that makes me come away and say, wow, I'm so glad that music exists. I need to make more of it. I need to talk about it. You know, this this thing is this thing is uh, really special. Along those same lines, I remember listening to a conversation recently and, and uh, there's a composer and he was talking about how music is the only language where most people learn how to read it. Most people learn how to kind of understand it, but they don't really learn how to communicate it. Do you see your job as helping people learn that last step? My job as, as, as a music teacher, if, if I could just kind of summarize what I think it is, I, I think, you know, even though I, I appreciate your compliment about uh, me being uh, a great musician or whatnot, I, 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 I don't want it to sound like false modesty, but I know that for a fact there are people who are way more technically proficient as guitar players, as singers. Um, uh, I, I look at myself more as just uh, I, I just make music. And I, I want to help people learn how to make music. And the, the best way that I find the, the approach to making music is to being inspired, it is from being inspired by the music I love. So the music I make is like a direct, uh, it's directly connected to the fact that I love music. And I just want to help people make that connection because, you know, those things are, I think those things are broken. You know, people, people love music people make music but a lot of times they're they're kind of disconnected activities um you know so so i i see my job as kind of helping people fill that gap with their own musicianship it's funny i have to say again ironically and i uh, i appreciate your modesty but that modesty trait is also something that the best musicians seem to have. <laughs> <laughs> so. well maybe that's maybe that's what makes people want to improve right they never think they've arrived if you think you've arrived then you're done right maybe yeah. maybe you just stop so before we move on to radiohead itself um because that of that is of course the point of this podcast i just want to touch on something else that you said there you said you have a degree in ethnomusicology and um i'm trying to make this show a little more approachable than my other i'm, I'm understanding that not everyone's a musician so I know what that is, but let's talk about what that is and and what it means and and why. Yeah. Yeah. So so musicology is obviously the study of music. So ethnomusicology, in terms of just like a pure definition, wouldn't be looking at music just in a vacuum, but looking at it as a, a function of the people who make it. So uh, ethnomusicologists uh, often carry out. Uh, tasks similar to how anthropologists might, you know, they'll go live in a community for two years and write an ethnology um, about the people, about their culture and things like that. So that that's if you kind of go beyond the level I went. Uh, I just came away with a four year degree. But uh, if you study in grad school and you get a Ph.D., you're expected fully to um, in order to you know become a full fledged eth- ethnomusicologist. Um, live amongst the people and understand what the music means to them. So it's kind of a interdisciplinary. There's a musicological aspect. There's sociological, anthropological. Um, lots of really interesting things there. And I was fortunate to to be at UCLA because a lot of the people who actually founded the field were actually teaching there, or or their sons, you know, their, or the next generation, you know, of the family was was teaching there. So. People who, who knew Pete Seeger and and um, just, you know, James Ketting and like these big monsters of the academic field. And the other way that I could explain ethnomusicology is um, I think earlier on in the musicological century, uh, probably in the early in the 1900s, uh, there was kind of a classification of all the different world's musics going on. And um there was the European kind of classical standard. And then there was all this other music that may have been seen um, by some uh, as more primitive or kind of you know, tribal music, you know, music by the, uh, uh, the pygmies or, or some kind of the Fulani, Fulani tribe, you know, they play flute. And, and how do we class, classify this music? It's not as complex as our music. So maybe it's, it's less sophisticated and their society is not going to 
uh, reach our level of sophistication of music until their society actually reach, reaches a certain kind of sophistication. I think uh, enough academics started to realize that's that's silly. That's absolutely ludicrous that uh, we can judge people from um, kind of our perspective. So there became a thrust of trying to understand music in the way that their people would think about the music. And so that led to revolutions in transcription methods and things like that. And a lot of a lot of back and forth actually between the two fields because musicology is 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 wonderful. It wouldn't ethnomusicology wouldn't be here without it. But uh, I think ethnomusicology has made some important pushes and advancements as far as uh, understanding music not from an armchair perspective, but uh, from from more of a human perspective. Well, and so much music, in my opinion, anyways, from the 20th century, um, got its most interesting inspiration from the East, for example, like when mm. the Beatles went to India, uh, Philip Glass oh, yeah. even, you know, went to India. And a they lot took of these... a lot of drugs, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> but they found something in the music, maybe, yeah. you know, partly from that or partly from the music itself. But but yeah. they, they that minimalist sort of... Um, aesthetic didn't exist before and and the the Beatles especially uh in pop music really introduced this sort of style do you think this is one of the reasons you like Radiohead is that they're so sort of uh ingrained in not just breaking tradition in sort of a bad way but 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 moving towards more interesting soundscapes yeah I I think I think the the thing that I like about Radiohead the most is they keep innovating it's Mm -hmm. like um the, the the best way I could describe it is, you know, when I was growing up and learning classical music and I was I was part of the San Francisco Boys Chorus and I was, you know, singing in operas and things like that. Um, I always thought that you needed to be able to write something that could be included maybe in the canon of acceptable music. I didn't realize that people could give themselves permission to write whatever they wanted. It just blew my mind that that somebody could do that. And I, I hear that in Radiohead's music. They, they write whatever they want. And, uh, you know, they listen to lots of weird stuff. And um, weird is, is totally relative. So for them, that's like, that's like their musical inspiration. And they are able to channel that. And um, I think that's what I'm attracted to is their permission to be themselves. <laughs> you talked to the uh, author of the book, Everything That's Right Place, Brad Osborne, and he said something along the lines of Radiohead knows how to push the boundary, but just far enough to make it interesting, not so far that no one will mm-hmm. ever hear it. He, he called it the Goldilocks principle. He wanted to name his book that, <laughs> and I could totally see why. Uh, he had an interesting observation um, saying that, you know, when, when Radiohead – tends to push the boundaries a little bit with maybe timbre. They may dial it back a little bit on song form. There's there's a balancing that, that goes on uh, between uh, the more outlandish or foreign kind of uh, textures and sounds and, um, you know, the, the balancing of that with song form and, you know, how many times you repeat the verse or chorus or, you know, things like that. So, so um yeah, he, he even had a term, I think, for for the 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 type of song form that Radiohead like to embrace. They they like to do an A, a B, and a C. And uh, usually you'll have like an A, B, A, or you'll have like an A, A, B, A, or something like that. And um, he had a term for it called terminally climactic form. When I say that, it makes me feel more intelligent. <laughs> Absolutely. <yeah. laughs> but I, I like it. I like I, it. I think the song he was referencing for that was Karma Police, where you have the, the normal verse chorus kind of idea. And then at the end there, that, that I lost myself bit is new. Absolutely. You know? that, that, that's the, the classic example of, of that. And I think, you know, I, I hope people embrace that song form more. It's, it's a nice little surprise at the end of a song. Well, think about it too. Like the National Anthem, for example, is arguably their most chaotic and bizarre output, but it's tied together by that simple repetitive baseline that literally doesn't change the whole song Mm -hmm. so so yeah i find this this concept very interesting and i hope uh to also reach out and speak with him on the podcast too actually so he'd be a great guest what was the first radiohead song you learned because of course now you've got over 300 youtube videos or close to anyways and what was it like i think i think it might have been foul start wow really yeah so you're a real in rainbows guy 
Yeah, I'm, well, I'm kind of a latecomer to, to radio. <laughs> you yeah. know, I, I, I think I grew up hearing all the singles. Basically, okay, I, I'll, I'll just tell you how, how I discovered Radiohead because that, that leads directly to to how I um, learned, why I learned Fast Arp as my first Radiohead song. I, you know, I grew up hearing Radiohead on the radio and, you know, I heard probably Exit Music. I've heard Paranoid Android and, you know, I heard Creep, of course, when it first came out. And my brother, I think he recorded it on a on a cassette tape uh, from from like a radio airing and played it for me. Um, and I, I had a college roommate that, that played pack like sardines for me. Mm. And I thought, this is, this is cool. This is weird stuff. And, um, it wasn't until I, uh, met a new, new newish kind of friend and he found out that I was a musician, um, that he started talking to me about Radiohead and I said, Oh yeah, you know, I've, I've heard some of their stuff. I like it. It's, it's really good. And he's like, wait, yeah, I mean, what do you mean? Like, have you, you sound like you haven't listened to their albums. Have you listened to their albums? And I'm like, ah, and I never really investigated much. I mean, uh, how good can an album be? Usually it's like one or two good songs and the rest is filler, right? That, that's how albums work, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he said, you're a musician and you don't know Radiohead's catalog? L- listen, listen, you'll thank me. L- let me burn you all the CDs. And, you know, it's kind of a confession here, but he burned the CDs for me. And at that time, it was 2006. Oh, wow. So um, this was before In Rainbows. Um, but uh, he he said, listen to these. And, and at the time, I was driving down to... Los Angeles to visit some friends and it's a it's a six hour five and a half six hour drive from San Francisco to, to LA and I thought okay well I guess I'll give this a shot and I put them in my car I had a five disc CD changer in my car and uh, I went through the order that that he recommended and he he thought I should listen to um, OK Computer first he thought I should listen to the Benz next and then Hail to the Thief, and then Kid A, and then Amnesiac, and then finish with Pablo Honey. And uh, and I'm like, why is this guy being so so uh, particular about how I listen? I'll, I'll just do it. You know, he said I should do it. Was this person me? No. <laughs> I've introduced friends in much that's the same the order, way. Huh? Yeah, yeah, pretty that's, much. I guess that's a good order. In 2006, now, now that yeah. order has to change, right? Because there's there's some more albums that have yeah. come since then. Um, yeah, I'll just tell you that by the end of that road trip, I had finished the albums probably right around the time I arrived in LA. My brain was hurting. It was just hurting, and I just could not. Like it broke my mind. It broke my mind to think, how are these all the same band? Number one. And number two, how have I gone this long without knowing that all of those songs that I had liked from my brother with Creep and, you know, uh, on the radio with OK Computer singles and even fake plastic trees and all these things. And then, packed like sardines in college. I didn't know that they were all the same band, you know, and it just, that, that, that totally changed my life. And and I I was left wondering one question, how am I going to proceed musically for the rest of my life? That's, that's all I could think by the end of that car ride. It's like this, this was a a life-changing moment as far as like, you know, music is concerned. And uh, all of that, led to, you know, me being ready when Tom York came out with the eraser and radio had dropped the bomb that was, you know, the pay what you want experiment for In Rainbow. So setting the stage like that, you know, when when In Rainbows came, that was my first uh, waiting for an album experience from Radiohead. Mm -hmm. And when it came and it came in the way that it did, uh, I turned out the lights I got my roommate. We're both excited. We're ready. We turned up some big speakers and uh, it was this very intimate experience. And me and him were just sitting in a dark room on the carpet, listening to the album. 
and uh, it it just it just exploded all of my expectations. It blew them to smithereens. You know, I I like all the highest expectations I had for it. it they just they just got exploded. And uh, he he asked me, man, can you learn how to play any of these songs? And it had just everyone was listening to it at the same time around the world. You know, October tenth, two thousand seven. And uh, I'm like, sure, you know, which one? And I had never learned a Radiohead song before that because, you know, I was still fresh. I, I, I was just listening, you know, I was still in awe. Like, you know, when you're in awe of music, you don't go and try to learn it the minute that you hear it. You just, you just absorb, you enjoy it, right? And so he said, can you learn any of these songs? I'm like, sure, which one? And he said, I really like Faust Arp. And so credit him, you know. And once I, once I figured out how to play Faust Arp, he said, you're the first right now. Everybody's listening to the song. Only the band knows how to play it. And you're probably the first guy that got out his guitar and tried to figure out how to play it right now. Why don't we put this on YouTube? And he ended up becoming like a, a, a videographer and like a, a film producer. And he's he's... He just had his camera with him. He's like, let me film this. Let me put you on YouTube. And I said, YouTube? I, I don't know. I don't know about putting myself out there. But at the same time, you know, like uh, it was such a formative, special experience that that uh, it really uh, pushed me out of my comfort zone. And until that point, you know, I'd pretty much been in my safe bubble of playing contemporary Christian music at church. <laughs> so it, it was, uh, you know, going from that to, to YouTube and all the people that, uh, you know, can, can make criticisms and things like that. I think I was like a little worried about that, you know, like what, what if people don't like my video, you know, but, but the, the experience just kind of, it inspired me so much. I just, I just had to do it. I was kind of a reluctant YouTuber in the beginning, but you know, early on 2007, maybe YouTube was a little nicer place to, uh, upload things. Well, YouTube was almost a non-existent place. I mean, it only started in 2005 and, uh, so a real pioneer. Yeah. I mean, you, th- this wasn't a thing yet, you know, so you, you, you know, I, I got Warren music as my, you know, username before it had to be like Warren Q two, four, eight Z. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. I got my full name. Yeah, it doesn't happen anymore. So yeah. that's just amazing. So, so let's talk about more about your, your experience with learning songs, because I, I find that many people listening and myself included, um, I'm, I'm a clarinetist. I picked up guitar and, Actually, one of the first things I did when I got my guitar, and you'll find this funny, it was in about 2008, maybe 2009, just as I was finishing up my clarinet degree, I was thinking about, well, what else would I like to play? And I've always wanted to play guitar. I've always been interested in songwriting. So I grabbed my guitar, and I'm pretty sure the first thing I did was learn Street Spirit by Warren Music on YouTube. So <laughs> That's cool. It's That's so really cool. funny to come full circle and, and talk to you. Oh, and then, man. But I want to thank you because it was such a great tutorial. And the, the book I had purchased, I bought like the Ben's book of, um, you know, whatever. And I just found it was not it was not working for me. And, and a lot of these songs, too, I, you get the song book and you find that they've been corded, but they're not really corded uh, effectively for guitar. So, for example, mm. let's walk through what you might do when you want to learn a song. Do you do you look at the melody? Do you look at the chord structure? Do you figure out the chords? I mean, do you figure out the tuning? Where do you put the capo? That's the hardest part for me. I mean, oh, I man. I can learn a song, but I need to know first where to put the tuning. And if you're able to get that tuning ahead of time, that, that's just amazing to me. So I know that's a lot to unpack, a lot of questions sort of in one, but but where do we begin? First of all, those chord books out there, you know, I'm glad that they exist, but they're rarely ever written by the artist that wrote the song. You know, uh, those piano, vocal, guitar books, they're, they're just not really um, there's 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 very little incentive to get it the way the artists actually did it. Um, a big part of it is just how I I view the information. I'm, I view a song as if it's musical information. When I'm trying to learn it, I'm, I'm not thinking about, oh, how, how much I enjoy this thing, I love this thing. When I'm in learning mode, it's a completely different mode. And then what I'm doing is I'm seeing all of the musical information in the song as kind of like data. Or you, know, you could look at it as like, you go into a room, there's all these pieces. And when you first enter a room, there's pieces and you know nothing, in, in particular is is making sense all, all at once but you you pick out these pieces that you you seem attracted to and for me that could be the melody it could be the the chord progression it could be the the uh, the particular rhythmic patterns whatever is jumping out at me I, I try to 
collect that, you know, pick the piece up and put it in my pocket. And I don't know what exactly I'll do with it, but I'll put it in my pocket first and I'll collect it. I'll collect it like I'm collecting and, you know, uh, uh, treasure, you know, collecting all this information. And and the easiest way to kind of uh, talk about this in a musical context would be like if I if I hear a particular note and then uh, that note, I feel like, hey, maybe this is the tonic. This is the home note. Then maybe I'll listen for all the other notes around it that can that I can, you know, gather all in my arms <laughs> all at once. It's, it takes a lot of working memory. Uh, or if you have pen and paper or your instrument, that, that works too. But, you know, I collect it all and then I find out, hey, how are these orienting to the note that I think is the tonic? And sometimes I'm wrong about the tonic and it's fine too. You can always, you know, re- readjust uh, the things that you think initially about your first impressions. But, you know, you collect these different notes and all of a sudden, oh, wait, hey, that makes a scale. Which which key is this, you know? And then Radiohead, of course, you know, they'll change the key on you in the chorus and make it a different mode. And then maybe they'll use an alternate tuning just to make all of your progress seem very, very <laughs> infinitesimal, <laughs> you know? Um, but, you know, eventually that'll, that'll lead to kind of, I think, um, just kind of com- a certain kind of comfort that comes with... Um, identifying certain things that stick out to you and then kind of figuring out how to organize all that information. That's what a, a major scale is, you know, it's just, it's just a way to organize notes from low to high, you know, and that's the way chords work. That's the way meter, uh, syncopation, all those different things work on kind of a principle of understanding relationships, whether it's relationships between pitches or relationships between musical events in terms of time. Right. So um, that's kind of how I would say it. Um, as far as alternate tunings, oh, man. Um, well, let's pick a particular song. So, like, there's one like uh, I Might Be Wrong, for example, in Drop D. I mean, that's pretty mm-hmm, obvious even mm-hmm. to someone who's new to guitar. Mm-hmm. But one that struck me as difficult recently, and I definitely had to go to your video or a couple others even just to get some other people's take, but was mm-hmm. Nude with that raised string four from a D to an E. Oh, Yeah. That took that took me a long time. Is that just a comfort thing you discover with guitar? Like, wait a minute, I'm always adding this finger. Why don't I just lower that string or or raise that string? Every every song with an alternate tuning has a needle in a haystack. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you'll have multiple needles in a in a haystack that all kind of fit together, and then you realize, oh, this has to be an alternate tuning because of X, Y, Z. As if it's like a logical puzzle, you kind of have to solve. But um, the needle in a haystack for nude was hearing a pull-off, and I heard we're in the key of E, you know, and I hear uh, I hear this as a one. I, I'm very fond of relative pitch. I heard a five, one, a pull-off, and um, that's B pulling off to E. And so you have this here. This note here, I, I, Sean's it's a long way away. seeing me on video right now. That's seven half steps away, seven frets. And I heard a pull off, okay? And a pull off would not be, you know, in and of itself anything spectacular. But if I pulled off from a B, I would have an open D string. And that's obviously not in the key of E major. And even if I tried my best, I could barely reach from my pinky to my thumb. And what my ears were telling me was that I was hearing a pull off from a B to revealing the note below as an E. So if I hear a B pulling off to E, then that lowest note either must be E, uh, fretted, capoed, or tuned. You know, it has to be one of those three, right? And I realized, hey, there's so many other things going on that sound like they're in standard tuning. Why is it just this one note you know because you have this like uh this one right here and then you heard this as well and then then my second needle in a haystack was and i heard another pull off but this time it's from f sharp to e my two to one so this this note right there is like pull off so i couldn't play that unless it was tuned so i realized hey So I realized I had to go. I had to tune it up. I had to tune the fourth string. And then it was. 
there it is. There's that second that wow. original needle in. Right, and and so you know, um, I've had to do this many times where I don't have the luxury of a video, and that has forced my ears, you know, out of necessity um, to to kind of really push push my ear to to the utter limits of 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 what they're capable of, and Radiohead's music does that to me quite often. I mean, these are my twisted words, and um, oh, I got to see that one live in Seattle, by the way. Oh, oh, you 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 got a treat. They don't play uh, that yeah. one too often. And Morning it's Bell, so good. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, oh man, oh man, that's so cool. Yeah. So, but I would say that like, um, their music is is so challenging because, um, you know, ultimately they're doing lots of things that are maybe not typical. So it doesn't matter how much experience you have with you know your your run of the mill diatonic. Or for music, Radiohead is going to be always a few steps beyond that. They're always trying to do something clever, especially because of the influence of Johnny Greenwood. I think he's he's always finding ways to stick five into four or six into four things things that don't fit. He, he's always trying to jam those in so uh, in a beautiful way. I actually was interested in your thoughts on this. Um, so mm-hmm. Johnny Greenwood is of course classically trained and is obviously orchestrating movie soundtracks and can clearly yeah. read music and. Uh, I've literally seen him reading music for the Ons Martino part and how to disappear completely, for example, once. <laughs> and um, someone like Tom York, on the other hand, though, I, I don't know if famously, but he, he can't even read sheet music. So what do you make not only of this contrast between the band members, but what do you imagine music is like for, for Tom York in the sense that he can't even read or understand, you know, theoretically, a lot of the things that we're even talking about? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm not so sure I would... Uh, say that he he can't understand theoretically what we're talking about. Maybe he understands it um, in his own way. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think I think I think you know if you talk to somebody who doesn't have any theory background, um, they'll still be able to connect with you on some basic intuitive uh, things. And and whether they have the words for it or not, you know, the, I think they'll pretty pretty much come away with the same understanding of like a four on the floor beat. Um, you know, or something that sounds too vanilla, you know, like C major <laughs> or something like that. I, I think a lot of people will, will come away with that uh, common understanding between, you know, theory people and non-theory people. But uh, I think uh, that's that's part of what what uh, makes such an awesome interplay, I think, mm-hmm. for, yeah. for, for bandmates who, who don't have the same musical background or, or even the same exact language that they can p- communicate on. They have to work together and they have to uh, um, essentially make a unity out of a diversity of, of opinions. Maybe they're using the music as the language and they're right, sort of transcending right. this conversation we're having. And <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like they're, sure, they're sure, using yeah. the music to communicate with one another. They don't need the language for it. They, yeah. they and they oh, communicate. Oh, well, you know, I, I, w- I still think that they, they probably have plenty of discussions. Tom New yeah. York just isn't using, uh, words like brev and semi brev and quavers and he's not using those words yeah uh, he's he's just showing it he'll play it they'll have a conversation about it you know maybe Nigel Godrich will come in and suggest a, a tweak or something I you know I wish I could be a fly on their wall yeah. and just kind of get a peek at their process but my guess is is there's probably a healthy amount of you know both uh, verbal communication as well as their the the kind of music as the language communication. I think it's probably a lot of both. Well, it reminds me of a Canadian band, actually. Do you know Matthew Good? No, I'm not familiar with oh, him. I should send you some some stuff. It's really great. But sure. when his band fell apart, I mean, I love his music. I love the guy. He's a great Canadian artist. I think he's one of the best songwriters of all time. But when his wow. band fell apart, there was a distinct change in his songwriting that, in my opinion, never really recovered because I think the guitarist uh. had a little more kind of pull in the song form than we realized. Really interesting forms, really interesting harmonies, really great guitar writing. And when that went away, we're just left with his songwriting. And and mm. that's why I think even with Radiohead, like the meld between the members is part of what's so interesting. And especially yeah. the fact it's the same original members. Like a band like Yes has yeah, been through crazy. literally 30 people in the same time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So <laughs> so along the lines of Matthew Good, though, you, you'll find this funny. And um, I wonder if you could even assist with this. So one time I tweeted Matthew Good and he was coming to Calgary and I said, hey, you know, there's a song you're playing. I really love it. It's called... Um, 
uh, The Inescapable Us. And you've never played it live. It's my favorite song. I just, it would be so great if you could play it here. And to my mm. amazement, I was at the bar with some friends at the time and uh, he tweeted back to me. And mm. um, I was like, hold the phone, everybody. I got to go to my phone. You know, I got to tweet back <laughs> to this guy for a few minutes. And he said to me, and I'll never forget it. And it was the weirdest thing. And uh, sorry for the strong language, but verbatim, he said, sorry, I can't play that song. It's in some fucked up tuning I forgot. <laughs> and for me, that was just like a... How sort of, devastating was that? A part of me died because <laughs> yeah, I was like, I, it did. I was like, man, here's this guy who I, I always thought of him kind of on an elevated plane and really, you know, compelling and interesting. And he can't even remember his own song. Yeah. How, how weird is that? You know, yeah, but yeah. I started wondering how many artists had this. So if oh, we extrapolate. It's more common than you probably think. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. But do you think that, yeah. and this is maybe a stretch, but do you think that any members of Radiohead have ever checked in on your videos to make sure they're getting something right? <laughs> Okay, I don't know about that. That, that, that cracks me up. That cracks me up. Uh, you know, I hope not. <laughs> I hope not because uh, because that would be that would also be kind of sad, you know, to think that they forgot their own tunings. Uh, but I mean, it, it. I wouldn't. Why not write it down? That's what I can understand. I yeah, I, I'm. I I I write down my my alternate tunings, yeah. you know, because yeah. I know that there have been plenty of things that I've played that that I really enjoy, and I come back to a year or two later, and I have no clue what I did, you know. And now I'm starting to take videos of myself mm. playing because sometimes I don't even remember, you know, just which string had had which note because I'm using some weird alternate tuning. But so it's oh, not as man, surprising that, as it might seem. Yeah, basically. No, no, no. I, it actually happened to one of my favorite artists and, and he, he made me an honorary uh, songwriter of that piece. Like he, he saw a cover I did on YouTube of like like a decade old song that he had written and he ended up going more in a singer songwriter direction than uh, initially when he started. He was much more of like a finger style guy and he mm. like he listened to a lot of finger style guys when he was writing and when I had discovered that song, of course, again, without video, I, I, you know, really, really pushed myself to learn this song. And I ended up putting um, covers up on YouTube a few years later. And uh, an old follower of his pointed him to my cover and he said, how did you even find these? They were like on a fan club CD. They weren't even on a, like a normal release. Mm -hmm. He's like, how did you find these, let alone play, play them, you know, note for note by ear? I'm sure I've forgotten how to play these songs, so they're yours. That's what he said on a on a YouTube comment, and that's probably one of the musical apexes of of my life. But it, it's so common. It's so common, you know. So write your tunings down, friends. Write them down. Don't forget. Take video if you can. <laughs> you don't want some guy, some crazy guy on YouTube, to be the 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 only connection back to your own song. So, you know, if Radiohead is listening to this, you know, I, <laughs> I hope you write it down. That's I, I make mistakes. I'm human. You know, I'm sure the tutorials I've written up, you know, put, put up, put up there. Like they're just, yeah, there's probably all sorts of problems with them here and there. They, they may not, I, I've gone back and, and looked and, and some songs I don't know how to play anymore. And I, and I kind of like, um, wonder you know how accurate they are and and i've seen them play live and every now and then as the music teacher in me like looks and sees hey is, there, is their <laughs> finger in the same shape as they played reckoner probably tom played reckoner probably two or three different ways in terms of like alternate chord shapes for like a minor and like b major and um he he, he did some different chord shapes and the first time i saw him play it live um uh in San Francisco at the Outside Lands Music Festival, he played it the way I thought he played it. And then everyone was saying that I was wrong because before they did that tour, I think they did it from the basement recording where he played it another way. And then I felt really vindicated on that one. And I'm like, he does, he does play the way I play. <laughs> What makes you think that he didn't but watch your not. video? <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! I, it's time I, I to go on tour I again. Better watch myself. foreign music. I won't allow myself to to think that. It'll give, <laughs> give me a well. It's ego. funny because you you laugh, but I mean, if it happened before, I mean, I find this really compelling. So wait, after your video came out, they toured again, and now he was playing it your way. I sense yeah, a no, connection. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know. 
But but for every one of those, there there are probably yeah. well there are I, I don't want to say probably and I'm I'm trying to shield my ego here, but there are definitely mistakes I've made in my tutorial. So I yeah. hope for that reason they're they're not relying on them. You know, and they're, they're definitely. I mean, it's a pro- process too. Like you can look at my YouTube uh, video portfolio, kind of like a, a little a document of of uh, the progress of one musician. You know, that's it's me and my my. I, it's, it's, um, it's not just, but the whole thing being a process of actually starting somewhere and then, you know, keep, you keep moving towards your destination. I hope when people see my videos, they don't think that there's some kind they're trying to be authoritative, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I'm just one guy, um, trying my best to learn songs by ear. Occasionally there's video stuff that can help me kind of bolster some of the things I'm, I'm putting out there. And, uh, but when there isn't, you know, uh, it's, I'm just one guy, just like the tabs that you read, you know, anybody who's looking for tabs and chord books and things like that, they're just written by some guy. And, and I think that's, that's really what I'm about is, is to say, Hey, you know, there's, there's, uh, you can outsource your, your musical learning to somebody else and, and ultimately get all of the insights about a song that you're going to get through somebody else's ears. But if you can build your own way to to do it you know why not and and this is just my journey you know that's that's kind of one way i think about my youtube channel it's just my journey of doing that i love that and i i do hope that one day that guy writing the books maybe can be you because i'd love a Warren <laughs> music radiohead uh, book of yeah, some maybe sort I'll, maybe i should write uh faber music or, or warner chapel and you know ask for a job <laughs> totally absolutely um so i'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about your massive success with the videotape video and I don't want to go too far into it because anyone interested can watch the almost half an hour long sort of video essay or deconstruction of the music. But but what does that success sort of look like for you in the sense that it's had almost five million views and uh, it's been discussed everywhere from, I think, you know, Vox to Vice or any other number of online platforms? Oh, man. Uh, at first, it was like um, this indescribable feeling because all of the videos I've ever made have been for my subscribers, honestly, Mm -hmm. like, and my subscribers, uh, I kind of feel safe with them. So it was a whole new audience, you know, Vox's channel, I think at the time had 2 million or close to 3 million subscribers. So they're uploading, you know, a video with me in it talking about stuff to an audience that has no allegiance to me, you know, no, no familiarity with me. And so, you know, I was nervous. I thought, okay, that this, this is going crazy. I don't know how it's going to be. And, um, there was a lot of positive. And then, um, the, the Estelle, the, the woman who, who interviewed me for that video, she, she gave me some advice on, on handling the uh, feedback because there's lots of feedback. Her, her, her comment to me was, you know, whatever amount of feedback you think you're going to get, just multiply it by a thousand. Oh my you know? God. So every possible opinion that somebody could possibly have about whatever you're saying is said. And usually the negative ones are the ones that get voted, voted, voted. Because, you know, people, people like to – I think people like to feel like they know something that um, other people don't, you know? Um, I, I think, you know, I, I can understand. And so, so the success quote unquote, uh, it was, it was definitely a mixed bag. It was like, wow, this is, this is, I realized kind of how, how much of myself I kind of like tied into, to the things that I was saying. And, and I realized, wait a second, I got to do a little ego check here. This is, um, you know, not everybody's going to understand. Not everybody is going to agree. And you, um, you can only do your best and try to leave it at that. You know, and it was, it was a good, it was a good lesson in uh, my attitude, but on the positive side of things, I like to, uh, stay, stay in the positive, <laughs> the, the, uh, the positive side of things is more people came to uh, my channel and saw the original video. And, um, I heard this one really, really cool comment. And, and I always remember, you know, not the multitude of comments, the thing that stays with you is really just these poignant things, right? These little poignant things where you interact, well, at least for me, you know, that that's kind of the coolest things connecting with somebody and somebody wrote a comment about 
how one time she had listened to um, videotape. She had listened to it, uh, but her iPod had started towards the end of the song because she had stopped listening to it, went to do something, came back to it and listened to it. And she said that where it started in the song, she once years ago when this happened, she was recounting the story. She had felt something different rhythmically about the song. And she, she had a classical background in music, but she couldn't figure out what she was hearing. And, and she said that was like this magical experience and she never had it again until she saw my video. And then she, when she saw the video and she saw me kind of explaining the thing that she had experienced years ago, she said it took her back and she was just overcome with, you know, emotion or, or some, I'm paraphr paraphrasing, but um, hearing that story it, it's like that is worth more to me than you know all the different reactions and and all the the I mean obviously the the clicks are nice and people buying my <laughs> video series is nice you know um, overflowing from uh, some of that reaction and success but but really it's these little things where I'm able to kind of hear from people and and feel like wow this this is actually real you know I'm not just like shouting into the void. You, it, putting yeah. something on the internet can feel like that. I'm sure, like if you if you were asked about your your podcasting experience, you know, you, you'd probably have plenty of feelings where, you know, sometimes you get to connect with your listeners, and that's special. But but a lot of times when you're putting it out there, you don't know how it's being received. You're not there with them. A lot of people, for the for the most part, are lurkers. You know, they may not even click the like button. Yeah. Well, that's the strange thing about the podcast, for example, in, in my realm, again, is that I, I'm kind of just in my basement putting out podcasts, but then I'll go to right. a, a clarinet conference somewhere and everyone and knows who I am and feel you. like they're my best friend. It's interesting. That's right. And they want to buy you a beer or something. Yeah, right? it's, it's odd. Cool? Yeah, yeah so I love I, it. But Yeah, yeah. So when I go to Radiohead concerts or, or occasionally, like I, the craziest one was I was at a random electronic music festival in Prague. Uh, I was just in Europe. Just in in the middle of a music festival, some random person recognized me, and I thought this is the craziest thing. This is I, you know, I'm just in my bedroom or I'm just in my living room, just doing these random videos, and and wow, you know, I I can't I can't describe it. it's it's you know exactly what that feeling yeah, is. It's, yeah. it's strange. It's cool and strange and. And awesome. <laughs> well, even I, I released my album, which is just a, a music of clarinet and marimba, but it was my own arrangements and it was recorded. And uh, oh, someone once commented, oh, thank you. But they commented one time like, oh, this was beautiful. It brought me to tears. And that was like, mm -hmm. wow, that's got to be one of the biggest yeah. compliments a musician can, can receive. Yeah. Yeah. And you almost so. don't even feel like, you know, you should get the credit for that. It's, it's, you almost just, well, that's your experience. That's beautiful. Yeah. Right. Who, who are you talking to? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that can't be me, but yeah. I wonder what Radiohead's re reaction would be to everyone, you know, feeling this way about their, their pieces, but uh, they didn't like it at first. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the last thing I want to touch on it. And if you're like me talking to Warren here, you've learned a ton about his sort of, uh, you know, intense knowledge of music and you're probably wanting to learn more so you're probably very interested to learn that uh, Warren not only offers Skype lessons but also has just started a new online theory and ear training course which I'm super excited to check out so Warren in a nutshell what does that offer people and why should they check it out yeah I think just just kind of what I said earlier it's it's just uh, there's a disconnect between the music we love and the music we make, a lot of times we feel inspired, but then the next moment we sit down in front of our instrument and we're like, oh, what do we do? You know, and uh, I, I think the, uh, the video series is just about uh, helping connect those two a little bit better. Absolutely. Yeah. And where can people find it online? Uh, WarrenMusic.xyz. Don't go to WarrenMusic.com. That's a that's a guy I've tried to buy the domain from many times, and <laughs> he insists. He insists. So oh, I'm I'm I have big plans for it, and uh, he I think he's selling one saxophone. Uh, he's sold. He's he's listed one saxophone for sale in the past seven years on WarrenMusic.com. So <laughs> WarrenMusic.xyz. 
Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I want to rocket through these listener questions, and then I've got a Ooh. quick thing called a lightning round, which is just basically one or two sentence Ooh. answers. So, um, and listeners, I really want to thank you for sending these in, or Reddit users, I guess. Um, some of the questions have been answered as we've gone along here, so I'm going to omit those ones. Um, but uh, some of the others I'm going to include, and I want to really thank you and invite you to send more. You can send all listener questions for upcoming guests to hello at okpodcast.com. And I'll be putting links to everything that Warren's talked about in the show notes at uh, okpodcast.com slash one. That's the number one. So Warren, this is a listener question from user Boti Kappa. And he says, talk a little about the hidden rhythm in Little by Little. And I'm not sure what he means. I'd have to re listen to that song. <laughs> little by Little. Um, I think they're referring to the idea that the, the downbeat for some is, is kind of obscure. And I say for some... Because uh, some people feel like this downbeat is here. One, two, three. One, two, three. Uh, actually, the downbeat is. And the way that Radiohead uh, does this guitar riff they kind of just let you they drop you right into it you know uh it just goes right in there and you don't know right away from from where uh where the song intros where the downbeat is and and uh yeah i would say that the hidden rhythm is is kind of if you hear the downbeat somewhere other than where it is and it, it was funny because uh when this when t the king of limbs came out and uh, I wanted to set aside some time to figure out a song. Little by Little was the first song I thought of because it was very guitar driven. And uh, somebody beat me to it, oh. you know, and I thought, <laughs> oh, no, I'm not the first. No, and then, you know, I watched his video and uh, it was really good. He he could sing it and play it and everything. And this is even before the lyrics were out. So, you know, we all made up our own lyrics as we went along. The, fir the first people who, who tried to give their tutorial on the song. But um, he thought the the downbeat was here but it's actually I'm oh, sorry minor chord there and then you find out where the downbeat is in the beginning of the chorus singing little on the beat and that's kind of when your your first clue is that the downbeat is actually not where you thought it was if you heard it that way um some people will rationalize it and try to say that there's a measure of like seven eight right before the chorus but i think that's just being stubborn and, and trying to apply music theory where where um it doesn't fit so the next question is uh jay broderick from reddit again um he says and this is probably not true of everybody, but uh, it says, like any normal person, I listen to several Radiohead albums a day. Okay, that adds up. <laughs> Basically, his question is, how is it that I can hear things over time that I, I didn't hear the first time? Like, always discovering new wow. things in the music that I didn't pick up on my loudspeaker and, you know, more, oh, yeah. more often to find in headphones. And, you know, I love this about Radiohead, too, is that I, even years later, I find new little catchy things that I, I never noticed mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. How do you think they hide mm -hmm. things in plain sight like that? Man, this is why I call Radiohead the Christopher Nolan of music. I've watched Christopher Nolan's uh, movie The Prestige probably 10 times. And every time I watch it, I, I uncover more and more about um, the movie's plot. And, you know, I won't spoil it. It's a great movie. Um, you, you need to go watch it if you haven't seen it, uh, any of your listeners. But I think of Radiohead like the Christopher Nolan of of music uh, in a way. They, they have a lot of parallels and they both like to tell a story with their work. But within that story, there's so much nuance so much detail, a lot of layers, um, themes. And I think um, how they do that, how is it that, that that's possible? Uh, they probably um, let it pass their test, I guess, for whether they're going to release it or not. And their, their test for releasing it must be very rigorous. You know, I imagine there's a lot of gnashing of teeth 
you know, for that biblical metaphor, a lot of weeping and gnashing of teeth in the studio. And they, they, they've talked about how torturous it was to, you know, just make these albums. Um, and, you know, it must just be a really, really difficult process because you know, you go through something once and the first pass is, is just not good enough. You know, they, they need to add things or even in some cases like videotape, they need to subtract things um to make it better and and i I imagine it just must be a lot of that you know put putting things through a test and saying hey is this is this really good enough um let's 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 improve it if it isn't you know so there's two more questions that are very similar to this one uh your pal cal asks how does how do you think radiohead constructs a cohesive album that works well as a whole (sighs) oh man um, I, I wouldn't know, you know, I've never put out an album. Um, I think for me, putting out an album would be, you know, really, really, um, amazing. My first focus is really just focusing on songs. And, um, I think Radiohead probably starts there too, because I don't think anybody, I, I have a hard time imagining anybody saying, Hey, I'm just going to write an album, you know, uh, maybe unless you're like, uh, the beach boys and just like these really conceptual type of albums and just filling everything up from there. But I think Radiohead probably starts with songs and that's how you end up with a lot of B-sides, right? You have a lot of singles and B-sides and just one-offs. So how do they make a cohesive album? It's probably by writing a lot of songs and cutting. Uh, they yeah. said uh, Tom York was famous for saying, I think that he, he doesn't like Hail to the Thief's length. He doesn't think it should be, you know, what is, what is it, 15 tracks? Uh, and he came out with like another track listing later on, uh, and he posted it on uh, Dead Airspace. Yeah, and, I remember that. Uh, yeah, so so it must it must have something to do with that. I imagine, you know, I, I'm I'm not an authority on albums, uh, writing albums, I should say, you know, but um, I do like to think that I know a few things about songwriting. So, you know, you write songs and and you make them the best that they can be, and and then after you're you're done with the collection of them. You know, what fits together, what doesn't, and uh, what were you feeling at the time, or what's your, your aim for, for thematically what you're trying to convey? And, you know, uh, for Tom York, it was climate change, you know, uh, in, in especially recent recent work. So mm-hmm. you see, you know, bits of that scattered throughout his solo work and, and through Moonshape Pool and and um, even, even Bloom, you know, which Hans Zimmer got to pick up and, you know, dress up with an orchestra. Yeah, which is amazing. Next question is uh, from Secret Seasons. What do you think Radiohead knows or understands about their music that a keen analyst such as yourself doesn't? Or uh, it's kind of a, I don't think that's meant in a derogatory way, but but what what extra level do you think that they're aware of that we are lacking? Um, Probably the imperfections. Um, I I would totally think that that would be what they would be more acutely aware of. Just just because, you know, if, if they're human, like we are, although sometimes we forget that, um, <laughs> that we're all tough critics on ourselves. So uh, I would not be surprised to hear uh, uh, a litany of things that they'd rather hidden that ended up in a, in like a you know, studio release or something. Or even done differently. And I think we sometimes experience this when they play songs live. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so they keep reinterpreting songs that uh, you hear morning, Mr. Magpie, you know, became like a more of like a rhythmic percussive thing with like triple guitar attack yeah. versus like just kind of a, like a shuffle kind of swingy ballad uh, that it was originally. So their songs probably overgo that evolution, not only because they feel like it, but because they weren't happy with it the mm-hmm. first time, you know? So they're, they're, you know, they're trying to actively create it and fashion it uh, into a way that, that satisfies their artistic sentiment, you know? The last one here is not really a question, more of a comment. It's from Philly Whiskey. He says, just tell Warren thanks for teaching me how to play Nice Dream and Airbag. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're very, very welcome. What was what was their name? Uh, Philly Whiskey. Philly Whiskey. You're welcome, Philly Whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a sentiment a lot of us can share. And uh, I really want to thank you so much for um, everything that you've done for the community worldwide. I, I bet hundreds of thousands of people have learned learned radio, radio hit songs thanks to you. So great work. Oh, I'm just lucky, lucky to be in this position. So I hope to keep making many, many more. So let's do this lightning round. There's six questions here, all to be answered in like a sentence or two. Are you ready? Ready. Have you ever seen Radiohead live? 
Yeah. What was the what was it like the first time you saw them? It sucked. What? Oh, really? <laughs> it was at SF Outside Lands. Uh, I was a new fan to Radiohead, and uh, everyone was singing louder than they were because I was really far from the stage, and the uh, sound crapped out twice during the show. I lost parts of All I Need. Yeah, oh, my God. So, so it, it, it bummed me out a lot. But, That's uh, terrible. It, it got <laughs> redeemed. It got redeemed with the next show in, in 2012 in San Jose. Um, seeing, them come, seeing them come out onto the stage for the first time. And, and I was like two or three rows back. Uh, nothing like it. I tried to go on the 2012 tour. Um, the 2008 tour is my first as well. I saw them four times. Yeah. And then uh, the 2012 tour, I was actually on the bus going to Toronto uh, when the stage collapsed. Oh. So yeah, I thought it was a real, Oh, that's awful. That's yeah. Awful. It was such yeah. a, such a sad day. So yeah, hopefully they'll get, they'll get justice for, for Scott Johnson. Have you ever met any of the band members? Uh, no, but I've met Nigel Godrich and, and oh, wow. I, don't think he, he, I don't, you know, the ego part of me hopes that, you know, he would have recognized me, but he didn't. So. Oh, that's crazy. Where'd you meet him? Uh, at an ultra Easter show in San Francisco. Um, so him and, and, uh, the, the trio were, they, they put on an awesome, awesome show. I hope they come out with another album. I love Nigel's side project. I love all Nigel's works. Everything from war paint to air, everything he oh, touches turns oh, to yeah. gold. Every, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Um, I find that many musical pieces remind me of certain times, situations, life events, relationships, and many other things. What is the most meaningful and profound thing that you associate with Radiohead's music? The people I've met through, through their music. Um, as with anything you like a lot, it can become a language for you. I think so. Radiohead has become a common language for for uh, me and a lot of people I've met. One of, one of my good friends uh, started out as a student who who saw a Go Slowly video of mine, the Go Slowly tutorial. <laughs> I agree. A friend of Radiohead is a friend of mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are three other albums you think that Radiohead fans should check out? Alpha Mist uh, is is uh, is a group that came out with an album I think last year called Antiphon or Antiphone A N T I P H O N. Uh, that's been on repeat for me. Um, I think Radiohead fans should check out maybe Dawn of Midi, Dawn of Midi's uh, debut album. Uh, that's I think it's called Dystopia, and uh, it's it's really really just amazing stuff. And for a departure from those two, I would say uh, um, I like the the War on Drugs last album. I thought that was fantastic, but I wouldn't necessarily know if Radiohead fans would be into it. Okay, I'll have to check into uh, some of those. It's not it's not difficult and emotionally torturing enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what is another passion outside of Radiohead that you have? Cooking and biking. Oh, I, I love cooking. I haven't been biking lately because I lived, moved in moved to uh, Massachusetts mm. and a uh, lot of snow and, and terrible roads, terrible infrastructure, drivers. Um, but I love cooking. I love cooking. I cook every day. What is something that you do on a regular basis that you feel leads to your success in, in life or music? I would say uh, when I get over myself. That's, that's the best way to be successful. I think, I think anybody who's doing something creative or, or kind of pioneering, uh, you can easily get into your own head and let your doubts kind of overcome you. That would say, I would say that's my biggest hindrance. So when I can get over myself and just do it, oh, man, then nothing can stop me. Man, I love that. That's great. Well, Warren, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. For those uh, listening, you won't know this, but we went through about 35 minutes of really – <laughs> bizarre uh tech glitches at the beginning i totally know the feeling as as a skype teacher i, I deal with this all the time especially as like a like a new student wants to start lessons then all the problems happen and like all my other students exactly have having perfect calls you know well i want to thank you for your patience and i want to thank you for being so generous with your time i hope that this gets a really really wide reach and i really hope that everyone enjoyed the conversation today um, you can check out more conversations like this in the future at okpodcast.com. And don't forget to check out Warren's website at warrenmusic.xyz. Warren, any last words for the OK Podcast audience? No, just thank you. Thank you for having me and, and letting me be in your ears. It's really personal and, and intimate. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I'm weirded out at the end. That's I think <laughs> I violated everyone with that. 
Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much, Ron, for coming on, and uh, I look forward to many, many new videos. Can we have a hint? Actually, what's next? What's your next song you're working on? Oh, oh, you know, I, 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 I'm actually really hard at work at, at my series. I, I, know, I don't just say that to promote it, but, but uh, I have uh, ideas to kind of make something more along the lines of uh, the videotape video essay next. Um, but it might be for a different artist. It may even be for Grizzly Bear. Um, I'm a big fan of Daniel Rawson, so thinking about um, breaking down his playing style, maybe, maybe I don't know. We'll sure. see. We'll see what happens next. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Warren. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening to OK Podcast. Show notes for today's episode can be found at okpodcast.com slash one. I really do want to invite you to check out the show notes page. Uh, I'm sure you've probably just heard that and you're probably not going to go there, but I spent about two hours writing it out and there's a thousand words of information there. Everything from links to all the stuff that Warren and I just talked about, including his music training course, to a list of glossary terms that includes things like syncopation or song form and other things you might not understand if you don't have a music degree. I'm going to try to keep doing that uh, for people who may be ha having trouble keeping up a little bit. I know we kind of went off the rails there a little bit, but, uh, you know, it's a little bit tough when we both have sort of an advanced knowledge of music and we want to have a, a real conversation. So if, I, if you ever do feel that we're leaving or that I'm leaving you behind, please just send me a, a message at hello at okpodcast.com. And also, you know, if you just want to say hi or if you want to add a comment about today's episode or anything like that, if you go to the OK Podcast website, you can actually leave a voicemail uh, and I'll maybe even include that on some episodes of the show. Don't forget to help D'Addario reach their goal of two and a half million recycled sets of guitar and orchestral strings this year. We often don't think about the amount of uh, instrumental waste that's caused. You know, instruments like clarinets use uh, clarinet reeds, for example, and most of them just get thrown out. So this is a really cool initiative. You can head to D'Addario.com slash playback. That's D-A-D-D-A-R-I-O dot com slash playback. Of course, if you don't have a set of strings to recycle yet and you need one to put on your guitar, head to okpodcast.com slash strings to pick up a set right now. Thank you so much to the Dario for supporting the podcast. And if you'd like to get an ad free, early access, high resolution, bonus content laden, all sorts of extra features edition of this podcast, head to okpodcast.com slash gold. This will also help me produce the show into the future. And this is a concept I'm quite passionate about. And I would really appreciate some sort of support along the way to really make this happen. Um, I really do want to interview the members of the band one day on here and uh, a host of other fascinating guests. So next up on the podcast, which should air on Monday if you're supporting the podcast on Patreon Gold and Friday if you're not uh, is with Brad Osborne who is the author of Everything in Its Right Place a book about analyzing Radiohead thank you so much for listening uh, I'm Sean Perrin signing off from Calgary, Alberta, Canada <laughs>